What's going on, everyone? And welcome back to the studio. I know. I told you guys we'd be at the Bassmaster Classic, and unfortunately, you'll see in this episode, we're not moving the neck a whole lot because, oh, well, we we're in a car accident, but we're alive and well. We're here, and we get to talk about the Classic. It was a bummer we weren't there, but hey, there'll always be next year. And I've been to the Classic before, so I, I can talk a little bit about it. And luckily, we're going to be joined by a few people that um, were at the Classic. So they can give us some insight, and we're going to break it down and talk everything that happened there. But before we get into that, we had a busy week. Let's start with the news, because this is Midwest Outdoors, right? We focus on the Midwest, and I feel like right now... We have a lot of things going on in the Midwest that are kind of important that you guys should know about, um, whether it's something you want to take action on or just be kept up in the loop. We'll start with Minnesota, our friends to the north, okay? So they have two things going on right now. One is they may restructure how they stock muskie, okay? So right now, Minnesota has a muskie survey going on on the DNR website. So whether you're a resident or a non-resident, you wanna maybe check this out, especially if you're a musky fisherman. They talk about whether they should stock n different lakes with musky, new lakes with musky, um, put more resource and money into certain lakes currently stocked with musky. Talk about the difference if you guys wanna chase regular musky or tiger musky. And the DNR has really taken the public's opinion on this before they revamp the structure on how they stock uh, musky. So, if you're a musky fisherman, if Minnesota's your water, go check it out, and uh, we'll le leave the link below and uh, weigh in on it. Because for you musky fishermen, I know you guys are nuts, and it's 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 hard to catch those fish, right? So let's make it a little easier. Let's not make it harder. I just got done filling mine out, so guys, click the link below and let your voice be heard, and hopefully it results in some more muskies down the line. Now the neighbor just to our north. Wisconsin, they also have a pretty big thing going on right now, but this is a more of an in-person hearing. They are actually discussing banning live scope. That and the reduced limits of fish. Now, if you don't know much about Wisconsin, they have a panfish limit of 25 fish, unless a specific lake or river has a different rule. I don't know about you guys, but 25 fish is a lot. Um, I'm all for a fish fry. Um, in fact, perch fishing is one of my favorite things here in Chicago and Illinois on the Big Lake. We're allowed to keep 15 perch, and that's one of the larger limits I know of. And to be honest, it takes a while to clean 15 perch. It feeds a lot of mouths, too. So we keep them sparingly, but again, you do want to keep fish. It's actually important for um, the, li the livelihood of these fish for their, so they're not stunted, so there's enough food to go around to all of them. So it's not a bad thing to keep fish. but over-harvesting is a very dangerous topic, right? So at 25 crappie, bluegill, perch, sunfish, rock bass, it can get a bit much, especially now with live scope. I'll leave it up to you guys, whether you think the limits should be changed or live scope should be banned. Now, if you ask me, I can't see any, any true action of banning live scope. Now in tournaments, who knows? We'll see how that goes. In fact, I just watched a little video where Hank Parker, one of the biggest names in the outdoor industry, is in favor of limiting or banning live scope. Um, and that's one of the first big names to really come out that's against it. So I'm kind of curious to see how the fallout comes from that. Um, obviously, we've had Randy Blockett uh, talking about how live scope should be banned since the creation of it. Um, so this is kind of the second voice that we're hearing now. So it's interesting. But when it comes to live scope, again, I don't think it's going anywhere, but obviously there are some concerns to it. Now, how we fix that, maybe limiting how far live scope goes, you know, this we're only in the early stages of it. So technology is going to continuously getting better. And at what point can we just go into a bay and scan a whole bay in five seconds? You know, um, I think at that point we're stretching a little bit, but fish fish safety, um, fish care, and the future generations are obviously what we care about here. Um, in the winter, when you have crappie that are stacking up 200 deep in a school, and you're allowed to get right on top of them with the live scope, you're able to see them and see how they react, there's maybe nothing wrong with catching those fish and releasing them. 
but if you catch 25 of those every single day and keep returning to them if they don't move a whole lot, well, before you know it, in a week, that school's completely gone. So I think, um, I think we will see some action on limiting the limits in Wisconsin, and we'll see how the live scope thing goes. So if you guys are passionate of what's going on in the Midwest or in your home state, have your voices heard. Check out the links below, and who knows, maybe you could be the deciding factor on what happens on your waterways. We have fishing in full swing, all right? And I know you hunters, I know we haven't talked about hunting in a little bit, and I know you guys are getting ready for turkey season. Um, in two episodes, we're going to talk about some spring turkeys, so be ready for that. But it's open water. And there's good and bad for that, right? Um, some of these bodies of water that are open now have never been open this early. Lake and river water is down bad. We didn't have a lot of snow cover. We didn't have a lot of ice. Um, and that's going to result in spring fishing being a little different. In fact, I think this whole year might be different. We could have earlier spawns. Um, algae blooms could be worse and more effective this year because the water is already warmer than it normally is this time of year. So it's going to heat up potentially more than it ever has before. Um, oxygen levels and nutrition levels in the water are going to be possibly scarce this year. Um, so depending on what kind of summer we have, we could be looking at a year with fish kills or maybe incredible longer spawns with fatter fish, depending on what the weather does, because these fish have already got into pre-spawn. You know, they might spawn a little earlier than normal, or some do just wait on time and the moon phase. So they're just gonna be a little plumpier, a little longer. Normally we talk about all fall, we talked about the fall feed bag, right? And the fish were, they were getting really fat because they get ready for a rough winter. Now when the winter isn't rough, they don't need all that weight. So here these fish are coming out of winter still with their winter weight on, kind of like myself. And they're already starting to grow eggs now too. So they're getting that size also. So I think we will see some records fall this spring because we're going to have fish that are not only fat, but also pregnant with the females. So a lot to look forward to. And we're already seeing that kind of happen. And let's talk about that. Let's jump into the fishing report. Guys, I want to run you down. We don't have any guests to talk about a fishing report because this episode, not only are we discussing fishing, but we're talking about the Bassmaster Classic. You know, that thing right there. Little nifty hat I got. We got Jimmy Houston, Mike Iconelli, G-Man, KVD. Some of the greats that have fished the Classic, you know. The Bassmaster Classic is the Super Bowl of fishing. So if you guys want to hear how that played out this year and what happened, no spoiler alert yet. Make sure you stay tuned for the whole episode because we're going to have some awesome guests talking about that. But let's run through the fishing report before we take a quick break. It is walleye season, everyone. The walleye are moving and shaking everywhere. From Lake Erie to the Rainy River, down to the Fox River in Green Bay, and some of our own tributaries here in Illinois, like the Rock River. People are catching big walleye. And when I mean big, I mean big. I've seen 32s caught, 31s and 30s, all fish over 10 pounds, truly incredible, like I'm talking about. Mix of the fall feed bag still on and that pregnancy weight. But it's been incredible. You know, we're seeing the rip and wrap come back a little bit. People have been catching a lot of walleye on that. Um, because it has been early and normally we still have ice this time of year, the hair jig has been probably the most dominant bait when it comes to the walleye fishing lately. Um, those purples and greens, uh, browns seem to be working the best, but other baits as well, uh, blade baits, stick baits, jerk baits, all working fairly well. They do congregate well together right now. They come in schools pretty much, kind of like your salmon and trout spawning. Um, so when you find a group of fish, you normally find more than one. So it's a perfect time to use that live scope like we were talking about, but you don't even need it right now because there's so many fish together that even if you don't have any electronics, what you need to do is just bump around, you know? Look, if you're on the main lake, look for flats, look for shoals. And if you're in the river, look for as Honestly, you can look for a dam. They'll be stacked up beneath the dam. But also look for 
uh, little dredges and holes because those fish will fill those holes and stack up. And you can vertical jig for them or cast them and uh, have a lot of success. Right now, nighttime trolling seems to be what is picking up the largest fish of all of them. But a lot of good fishing to be had for sure. Now up at the Rainy River, like I was saying, there are some walleye and sauger being caught, some sturgeon too, but believe it or not, we're still getting some ice reports from Lake of the Woods. They, that, they got cold again last week. Um, so if you guys have an itch for one more week, this is probably your last few days to get up there. I just did get reports of Upper Red Lake clearing out. They had safe ice just five days ago and now half the lake has open water which to me was a little confusing because it's been below freezing the whole time, but that is what mother nature will do. When you have strong winds and sunny days, sometimes the temperature doesn't matter a whole lot. So that's why, especially early, early ice and late ice, safety is number one as always, um, but that's your reports. So realistically, I said it was over a couple shows ago, but I think this is finally the last week of ice fishing in most places in America, unless you get out to the mountains or so. And then something I've been doing a lot lately is pond fishing. If you guys are in the Midwest right now, even if you're up north, your ponds are probably um, open now. And it's a great time to go out and catch panfish or bass. Crappie are probably the most active fish right now in a pond. Um, it's great to use a slip bobber, use some live bait or little little plastics, little one inch plastics, anywhere from four to eight feet under a bobber and work those and see how it does. When it comes to bass fishing, you wanna go slow. Use a jig, use a Ned rig. Awesome techniques in the spring also are a jerk bait and a rattle trap. And speaking of a jerk bait, I think that is how we will transition. So when we come back from this quick commercial break, we're going to talk about how this bait made $300,000. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. What's going on everyone and welcome back. Hey, this is the Bass Master Classic episode and it is time we get into it. The, the key moment I really remember is watching the classic. It was, it was Brandon Polinick's first ever Bass Master Classic. He was fishing through the Bass Nation, which at the time I was fishing. Um, you know, anyone can qualify through it. You, you just have to belong to a BASS club and fish your club event and top members of your club get to go to state, top state qualifiers go to the nationals, and then the top from nationals get a chance to fish the Bassmaster Classic if you're the number one from your region. So this, this young guy, Brandon Polnick, you know, handful of years older than me only, qualifies through Idaho of all states. And at the time, Illinois was not a really great fishing state. You know, we had one guy, I think, from Illinois that was on either one of the tours. Now we have a handful of them, thanks to the youth fishing program. But so we're watching these guys fish on the live and it, the coverage then wasn't the same as it is now, right? But everyone's fishing in dense fog, okay? And they're in this, they're in the Red River down in Louisiana and they're in a lake portion of it right now. And and Brandon's fishing, he, he, he catches a big one and they're panning back to Skeet Reese, who's catching good fish, and they're panning back to Kevin Van Dam, who's catching nice fish. And these three guys, they don't even know it, but they are all within feet of each other. And the fog is so dense that they can't even see each other. Well, not to mention the minefield of stumps that they were fishing. So it was so cool to see one of the absolute best do 
almost the same thing, slightly different than what this kid was doing. And the tournament was so close. Of course, Kevin, I believe, ends up winning this tournament. Um, what's new, right? He has a share of the most classic championships ever, I, four. And he's been in it 25 times. The only people that beat him are Rick Klun and Gary Klein at 30 and 32. I think he finishes fourth in that event, you know, and, and that's when it was reality to me that anyone who's passionate about it, that really wanted to do it, that would put the time in on the water could qualify for the classic. Now it's gotten a little harder through EQ and everything, but average Joe, someone sitting on their couch right now, you could qualify for the classic. Now my recommendation is if you're sitting on the couch watching this, you should get out and start fishing if you're going to make the classic. But you can learn a few good things too coming up here, so don't leave quite yet. The Classic is, like I said, the Super Bowl of fishing and of bass fishing. It's a three-day event. Normally, the pros fish four days, but for the Classic, it's just the weekend. Three-day event, right? And it goes to a few different lakes. It used to travel more. Now they kind of have a, a three or four lakes that they kind of hop to. Next year, it'll be in Fort Worth in, Dal in Texas. Um, but this year, it was on Grand Lake down in Oak Oklahoma, held in Tulsa. And they have a three-day convention that goes along with it with parties and vendors and food. And it's a whole show. If you've never been, you should go. But it's made careers like Hank Cherry and Jordan Lee. They were the last two that went back-to-back Bassmaster Classics. And now we have a new name with Justin Hamner winning $300,000 and a wire-to-wire, -wire, all three days leading and finishes with 58 pounds, three ounces, to take home the check. It was a really fascinating event, especially because it was really close. Um, we had a couple guys from the Midwest, it was two Wisconsiners finished in the top four, and they kept the whole weekend really interesting because really if Justin slipped up a little bit and didn't land a four or five pounder each day, or someone caught an eight pound freak out of Grand Lake, the tournament could have been different. But Justin wins. and. Not only did he win, but he won with a technique that has won, I think, four or five last Bassmaster Classics. And that's that guy right there. A jerkbait. The epitome, the, the definition of spring cold fishing, the jerkbait. Um, you could fish it fast, you could fish it slow. You could fish it long before forward-facing sonar, but now, with the advancements of forward-facing sonar, and what I was watching Justin do at the Classic, is seeing these fish suspended and a little bit offshore and being able to pinpoint them with this bait. Now, color mattered a lot. I saw Justin fish in two different uh, baits for most of the event. Uh, this was one of them, this Yozuri Minnow 100 right here. If not the exact color, very similar to the color he was using. The other, one, the other bait was a little more slender um, in a nude color, but he worked these baits simultaneously um, back and forth, and he caught a lot of good fish on them. Patience was the key. Um, covering a lot of water also was important, you know, from main and secondary points to in between docks, he caught a lot of fish. So not necessarily junk fishing, but keeping the trolling motor on high, finding those good active fish with the live scope, and then throwing, again, one of the best baits when it comes to cold water fish, when it comes to suspending fish, when it comes to fish that are turned off, or just fish that are chasing bait fish, because there's not many better offerings to look like a bait fish than this. It's a great bait. If you guys haven't tried a lot of jerk bait fishing, I highly recommend it. Be patient, try different styles of it, different retrieves, but you'll definitely put some fish on shore or in the boat this season. Now listen, enough about a bait, because a bait is only good as its angler that is casting it. So now we have the pleasure of sitting down with some competitors from this year's Bassmaster Classic. We are with our first guest of the day on our Classic Special, and none other than Easton Fothergill, a Minnesota and Midwest native. What's going on? Not too much. How are you? You know, we're doing well. Um, we rung the head pretty good this uh, last week. We were in a bad car accident. That's why I couldn't make it to the Classic. So we got to join you on here instead of in person. But um, you know something a little bit about uh, brain brain issues, right? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
kind of um, unfortunate, but yeah, I do know a thing or two about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, more, more you went through much more than a car accident. But before we get into that, um, you know, I didn't have anyone lined up for a fishing report this week. So being being from the Midwest, uh, right now he's at school down in Alabama, uh, not not Auburn War Eagle, everyone, but um, that's all right. Um, if you were home right now, granted, I'm sure normally this time of year. Uh, you'd be ice fishing still in Minnesota right now, but real cold water for most of the Midwest. What are you, what are you thinking? What are you doing? I guess if it, if I was at home right now, I'd be targeting the crappies still kind of in their basin areas is what I would be doing for the next couple of weeks until it really gets warmed up and they start moving shallow. That's, that's what I really like to do as soon as the ice gets off. So that's what Big I would be doing. Guy. Yeah. I'm I, I'm a crappy guy until you can fish bass in Minnesota and then I'm hundred percent bass, but I do like to catch some crappies. Hey, that's something you got in common with one of our other guests that's joining us, Mr. Trevor McKinney. Both college qualifiers, both love catching crappie when it's not true bass season. <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a good time for sure, and it really allows you to get really good with your electronics too, which I really like. You because really, you know you throw in really small baits and that sort of thing, so it definitely gets you really dialed in with everything. Yeah, I'm you know obviously everyone talks about live scope and how it's changed bass fishing and everything, but live scope with crappie fishing is light, like life changing. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. That's where I really uh, learned how to use live scope was with crappies. Cause I remember we got it like at the end of a winter. And then the first time I ever used it was actually crappie fishing. And it was just eye opening how many crappies are, can be in like in, in a school and just, just how, what their behaviors is because you know you'd catch a crappie out of a school and then they just like rush to bottom and just disperse and then you can watch them like get happy again and kind of rise back up and then you can catch them again so i would have never even thought that that would happen so definitely taught me a lot about crappie fishing yeah the fish behavior is the biggest thing you know i tell people it doesn't make you catch fish but you can understand what they're doing a little bit better exactly it just all it does is show you the fish and you still got to catch them for sure so it's it's a really cool tool for sure and I'll tell you what, I understand why, especially you guys like your crappie up there, because we just filmed recently over on uh, Upper Red Lake, and I caught some crappie that were bigger than half the bass I catch in Illinois. So <laughs> there's some big ones in red for sure. But no, it, I love crop fishing. It's a it's a really good time. Well, hey, we'll save crappie for another time. Uh, <laughs> you just fish the granddaddy of them all. The Bassmaster bass 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 Classic. Yes. Yeah, it was life-changing week for sure i still get kind of goosebumps thinking about it it was it was such a cool experience and i want to get back so bad i get goosebumps for you guys like since i can remember that was any bass fisherman any tournament fisherman maybe even any fisherman that doesn't even do the whole bass thing the Bassmaster classic is like the dream it really mm -hmm. is it's the childhood thing that gets you going i feel it the bumps are coming up they're coming up i feel it yeah, I mean, take off every morning with like thousands of people and Mercer announces your name and they all cheer and everything. I was just like, this is a dream right here. I like just didn't even feel real, really. It was it was a crazy experience. So before we get into how the week went, we we actually talked about you without you knowing, maybe um, because you had you had quite a little bit of a bumpy road and you almost didn't even fish to qualify for the classic. Yeah, so it was last August. Um, I was at the college national championship when everything happened. I just, just just started getting a headache in practice, and you know, I I get headaches all the time. Didn't really think anything of it, and uh, it just kept getting worse and worse. And I actually made it through the tournament just with ibuprofen and stuff, just taking a bunch of it, and then got back to school after kind of got moved in and then I just got progressively worse and worse uh eventually to the point where I wasn't eating wasn't getting out of bed like not doing anything and my roommates you know that's very abnormal for me I'm a very active person um they just knew something was wrong so they kind of they they threw me in the car and took me in and they they put me in a CT scan and they found a mass in my brain um and then they transferred me up to Birmingham and then they threw me into surgery right away after an MRI um, at first, they kind of, they didn't know if it was a tumor or an abscess. Uh, thankfully, it was an abscess. The MRI showed that, and then that's when they threw me into surgery. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was it was awesome feeling waking up from surgery. That was I didn't have any pressure in my head anymore. I felt really good actually right when I woke up. So that's awesome. I was super grateful for that. Um, and then after that, uh, I uh, re kind of recuperated in the hospital for about a week. 
and then I actually moved back home to Minnesota just to be around my family and really keep uh, healing. Uh, and then at that time, it was crunch time because I had the college classic bracket. That was the tournament that, you know, I'd been working towards my whole college career, and that's what qualifies you for the Bass Match Classic. Yep. And I was about a week away from that only when I got cleared and was able to fish again. So then I had to move back to school, grab the boat, and then drive all the way up to Kansas in that week to be able to fish that event. So it was it was, it was, was a wild, wild experience, but super grateful for how it worked out. Something tells me even if you weren't 100% cleared, you would have still found your way to fish that event as long as you were upright. No, I was telling my parents, like, I don't, I don't care if I have IVs hanging off me. I don't care what I look like. I'm, I'm, I'm fishing this event. Like I put way too much work into making it here. Like I can't miss it. So I was going to find a way somehow. Now that bracket happens. I take it. Uh, your teammate was also in the bracket. Yeah, I actually had three teammates in the bracket. So how that bracket works is you have the Bassmaster team of the year, which was me and my teammate. And then it's the top three teams from the national championship also qualify, which we had another teammate in. So that was two more kids from our team. So we actually had four out of the eight kids in that bracket, in that bracket tournament. And the championship came down to? It came to myself and a kid named Tucker Smith from Auburn. Uh, Tucker doesn't get beat a whole lot, but you know, you stuck it to him that day. He's, yeah. He's, he's, he's a tough one to beat for sure. He's, he's a winner hundred percent. So it was, I knew I had my work cut out for me, but you know, I really do think it was my time and it was, it was just meant to be that week because there was some stuff that happened that final day that just does not happen. So it was, yeah, super- it's, it's special, you know, when that gets to happen, I was fortunate enough that, um, the bracket when my buddy Trevor was in it was in Alabama and we're both from Illinois, but I was living in Alabama at the time. So I got to go watch him on the final day. And I was like the only boat watching him. And um, again, it wasn't me, but it didn't matter. Like the emotions are just so wild. Yeah. Trevor's always been a guy that I can relate to. We kind of have the same personality, I feel like, and I've always been a huge Trevor fan. So I followed that event on lay super closely and I was super happy when he won. So now all the all the pre-notions happen and you know i'm sure winning that you got some sponsors and life changed a little bit and you you're preparing for this classic um had you ever fished grand before i hadn't but i did go over there around thanksgiving and looked around a couple days because i had a i have a friend who lives right by grand and i just went up to his family's place for thanksgiving and then i just kind of snuck over for a couple days but no tournaments before this tournament so practice happens. What were uh, what were the thoughts like in practice? Was it overwhelming? Were you second guessing yourself more than normal? What was? Uh... I mean, it's it's hard to block out all the media and all just all the buzz going around everything. But during practice itself, I was actually really focused and everything felt normal because Grand's a big lake, especially for fifty six boats. It's a big lake, and you don't really don't see many people, so it it really didn't feel any different. But all those off days and on the media day and all that was just like, I just want to go fishing. Like it's, it's hard to, it's hard to keep your, keep your mind right during all that. But no, it was, it was all good. And it was super cool. Yeah. You know, I was probably, it's probably a good thing. I wasn't there. You know, I'd probably throw more distracting goofiness into you guys, you know, (laughs) you already, you already had to deal with Mercer and Pat Renwick down there running around. So I know you guys had plenty of, plenty of energy. Um, But so, all right. So the tournament comes, you know, I'm following you. I say, you know, I think I really believe this kid's going to have a good finish. And day one, little Rocky. Day one of practice, I had found an area that I was like super confident in. Like it was the first area I went in during practice and I caught two great big ones right off the bat, like boom, boom. Nice. And then I I cut my hook off my jig and I just kept flipping around. And I ended up getting like 25 more bites. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like this is incredible. And then I left that area. And I went the rest of the day without getting another bite. So I was just like, okay, I just found an area that's happening. Wow, so far. Yeah. I think the next day I had like three keeper bites all day. And then um, the next day I had like five bites or something still pretty tough. And then we had an off day. And then we got the official practice day on Wednesday. So I was just kind of throwing the idea around, do I go back there? Because if I don't get bit, that's pretty much all I have. I ended up deciding to not go there because that's pretty much all I had. I didn't want to just mess with my head because I knew I was going there regardless of what happened. Mm-hmm. So I just went out and found new more new water, ended up stumbling on another pattern, which mm-hmm. is really what ended up carrying me through the tournament. But yeah, on day one, I went to that really good area that I found and the water had dropped like half a foot and it was like way clearer and ended up wasting way too much time in there. And I was actually just about to leave and I caught a five pounder. 
So then <laughs> it's like 11 o'clock and I was just like, oh my gosh, like, what do I do now? Like, do I leave? Was that just a fluke fish? Um, I ended up running back through a couple of my areas in that creek and just just because I thought maybe the females are pulling up and ended up not being the case. I finally pulled the plug at about noon and ended up calling a couple more times the rest of the day. So yeah, that that day one was definitely a little bit disappointing for me. That big one really, really saved me. But I guess, yeah, on day two, I just went out and ran completely new water the whole day and ended up having a really good day. Moved all the way up to like 15th place or something. I think I was a 40th after day one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was about one o'clock. I, I caught a five and two fours back to back. And just, I was super excited going to day three. Um, but yeah, roll in there on day three and I drive by Adam Rasmussen, which is in second. Mm -hmm. Cooper Gallant is sitting on my on my place where I caught my big ones. And then just behind, just past him is Justin Hamner, who ended up winning the tournament. So I was just like, well, I found the right area, but now I feel like I'm in these guys' way and, you know, they're all beating me. So I can't, I can't really block them or anything. So I kind of fish around that area a little bit and it I caught I caught like two, three pounders or something, but it just wasn't happening. So I ended up pulling the plug there and ran new water again, ended up stumbling on a couple of nice ones. So well, hey, listen, Ju Justin uh probably thanks you. You know, he he he's got so much going on, he couldn't join us this week. So, you know, maybe uh in return since you had to carry his weight, you know, here in the podcast, and uh since you gave him a uh, made sure he kept his fish, you know, he could buy uh he could buy um Oh, the sweet and spicy, I think. That was my favorite burger down at the old Whataburger. <laughs> no, it was, I mean, it was super cool to find that area. I don't know where they were on day two. I don't know if I just didn't see them or what, but it was definitely super cool that I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say I would have caught what they would caught, but it was just cool to be in the right area and kind of stumble around on. the winning fish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that was, that was kind of a cool feeling. So now you've had a little time to reflect over it and be done with it. Um, what if one thing you could do different? I know you could beat yourself up forever, but if you could do one thing different, what would you do? So on day one, I I had that voice in the back of my head, like you need to change, like you need to you need to switch things up. And I just wish I would have listened a little bit earlier to that voice because it's it's hard with all that buzz to have the confidence to just scrap everything and go run new water. That's a tough decision, especially yeah. in the classic. So I just I, I had that voice way earlier than I actually decided to leave. So I wish I would just listened a little bit earlier to my gut. That's really the only dis only, only thing I would have changed. By the way, what'd you what'd you catch them on? How'd you catch them? I had two deals. Um, my my primary deal was a, a jig. Um, I was just flipping it behind boat docks and also China swing banks. Um, and then a mag draft was also my secondary deal. I was throwing that on windblown points, and that was a super fun bite. They were just they would knock the rod out of your hands when they hit it. And I did catch some here and there on a jerk bait, but that was just a couple fish. So those were my two primary deals. Oh, I love those swim baits so much. It's fun. It's really fun. So fun. It is so fun. Well, what do you got coming up for the rest of the year now? Uh, month of April, I got a bunch of college tournaments. Um, I think yeah, next week I go to Table Rock in Missouri. Yep. Um, and then the week after that, I have Kentucky Lake and Lake Hartwell. So right. I'm all over the place in April. And then the first week of May is the next Bassmaster Open on Logan Martin. So I think I'm gonna go pre-practice there this weekend. So. Well, always a good time to spend time on the Coosa, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I love. I told people I loved the Coosa and I loved Lake Martin when I lived in Alabama because um, although primarily spotted bass fisheries like we don't really have here in Illinois, they fished a lot like uh, Midwestern rivers and impoundments, I thought, you know, with the clear deep water that they had on Lake Martin. And then just the way the Coosa is, it, it kind of felt like being up in like lacrosse a little bit, you know. There's you can definitely relate it to quite a few different places. It's definitely it's definitely a great place to go out and just learn new techniques and stuff. Cause where I'm from in Minnesota, we really don't have like we don't have I mean we have the Mississippi, but it's not like it's it's really small where we're at. It's not like lacrosse. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely a super cool place to learn new techniques and stuff. And if uh, anyone wants to check out what you're doing, uh where where can they see it? Uh, I'm I'm pretty active on Instagram and Facebook. My Instagram is just Easton Fowler Go Fish, and my Facebook is Easton Fowler Go Fishing. So pretty easy to find, and that's that's kind of where I keep everyone updated on what's going on and where I'm at and what I'm doing. So yeah, you can follow me there. Awesome. And you're fishing all the opens this year, or? Yep, I'm doing the EQs. So. All right. Well, when you come up to our neck of the woods, maybe I'll draw you as a boater. <laughs> I hope so. That'd be a fun time. 
I promise you it'd be a good time. I, I don't know if we'll catch fish, but I promise you'll have a good time. <laughs> well, I do my best to get, to put us on some fish. There you go. Yeah, you're the boater. That's right. I don't even have to worry about it. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, man, thank you for your time. Um, everyone, make sure you're checking out Easton. We are very thankful that you're healthy and well. You know, make sure that noggin stays good. All right. <laughs> I'll do my best. Don't worry, growing you. water balloons in there. <laughs> We can't have any more of that. So no, more of that. All but, right. Uh, thank We're you. gonna take it to commercial one more time. Thank you for the college champion and Bassmaster Classic Qualifier, Easton Father Gill. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. And now with my buddy and the 2020 college bracket champ, Southern Illinois' own Trevor McKinney. What's going on, Trevor? Oh, not a lot, Jim. Just uh, in between tournaments right now, waiting for the next open to come upon us. Yep, it's open season. You're doing the EQs, trying to qualify for the elites and uh, the classic again. Um, before we jump into talking about the classic that you fished, when you look at the opens and the schedule coming up this year, which one do you look at and you lick your chops a little bit and say, all right, out of all the ones on the schedule, this is the one maybe that I like my chances the most to head to the classic again with a win at an open. Yeah, I think uh, it would have to be Lake Eufaula in Oklahoma. Um, it's in the month of June. We fished Eufaula last year in the opens, uh, the same month in June. And I, I had a fifth place finish at Eufaula. So I've got all of that, you know, past experience from Eufaula. I always do good in Oklahoma. I've done good on Grand. I've done good on Lake Hudson. Um, and of course, Eufaula. So I, I'm look, looking forward to Lake Eufaula. I think that's my best chance at making the Classic. But shoot, you just, you never know with uh, nine events, you never know when you're going to have one of those breakout events. Um, so we still got six events left. Um, our next event's on Logan Martin. You, you never know. I could have a good event on Logan Martin. It's going to set up my style of fishing. So, uh, I'm looking forward to the next few events for sure. I remember speaking of 2020, I remember a time spent on that uh, Coosa River where some good stuff happened. Coosa River has always been good for me. I won the Bassmaster College Bracken on Lay Lake. I won a Bassmaster Wild Card on Lay Lake. Um, the Coosa River has always been good for me. So I, I'm really looking forward to Logan Martin. I might get a chance to go pretty practice and go look around a little bit next week. Um, so it, it's a tournament that I'm definitely excited for. So we just talked to Easton Fothergill on here, um, you know, this this year's college rep. And he's saying he always looked uh, up to you, how you do things. He likes your style of fishing, how you conduct yourself. Um, what is it that has made you um, someone that's truly meant to fish? Because in my eyes, I can't see you doing anything else. I've always just loved fishing and and you have to you have to love fishing to to do what we do. You can't just kind of go at it halfway. It, it's one of those deals you got to be fully committed. Um it's got to be your lifestyle and that's always been my outlook on bass fishing. It's always been what I've wanted to do for a living. It's always been, you know, my passion, my dreams, and I think you have to have that mindset to really be successful in this sport. Um and that's always been my mindset and it will always be my mindset. Um, whether I continue to fish or, you know, have to go get a full-time job and, and fish on the weekend, I'm still always going to have that passion for bass fishing. Something about those green brown fish that just drive our brains crazy. So let's go to the classic. Um, you fished in the 2021 classic and, um, you know, what, what's your, I mean, I know you have a thousand memories of it and could talk about it probably for hours, but 
what was what was something that stood out the most to you? You know, what was the thing that um, really still sticks in your brain from that weekend? Yeah, you know, the Bassmasters Classic. You know, most tournaments are just like a turn, like another tournament. Um, but the Bassmasters Classic is different. You know, the the media is extreme. Um, there's there's media everywhere. Everybody's it, it's way more of a mental game than most tournaments, just because you practice a week before the event. Um, so the fish, especially in the spring, you know, my classic was a little different because because I fished in June. Um, but still, we had a really strong shad spawn going on when I fished the classic, and uh, it just kind of dissipated as the week went on. So the fish just changed a ton between practice and the tournament. So um, it's just a really stressful week. Uh, I just remember stressing out a lot, uh, and it goes by so fast. I remember it being the first day of practice, and then all of a sudden it's over. Um, so it goes by super, super fast. Um, but it, it's a different tournament for sure Be, with the media, um, social media. You know, we have a media day. We have the night of champions one night. Uh, one day we've got, you know, a day set aside for meetings. Uh, usually the lake is over an hour away from where we weigh in at. So it's just mentally very, very, very stressful, physically very, very stressful. It's a very stressful week. Um and it goes by super fast. Looking back at it now, or let's say a day after it finished, what was one thing you would have changed if you if you have anything? I made some rookie mistakes in my classic. And uh, as I fished the opens year after year, I've gotten way more mature in my decision-making skills. Um, I've just matured as an angler in general. But um, there's definitely a couple things I wish I would have done different. I uh, wish I would have you know, thought more about the wind. We had some strong winds the first day. I, I should have went left. I went right. And then once after I went right, I went left and guys already blasted them on my stuff. Um, so I, I would love to have a redo. I actually had one of the better practices I've ever had in my life. I thought I could win the classic, but uh, um, I would definitely wish I had some redos. I had a lot of miss fish. It was just, it was a hectic week, but you know, you fish different when you're under that amount of stress. It's not like, um, you know, everybody just says, well, we just go fishing. It's it's not that case. No, I don't care what people say. Like everybody's stressed during the classic. Um, even guys like Jason Christie, this one classics, you know, Kyle Welcher, your angler of the year last year, he was even stressed out this year. It's just a super stressful week and you make decisions that you normally wouldn't make um, just because of the stress that's put upon you. So you fish the classic, obviously, you know, I think that helps you know, like you said, grow as an angler, learn situations, maybe help with getting some sponsors. But um, has it helped with situations this year? You know, you're sitting in 10th, uh, ninth or 10th, you're sitting in that top 10 to qualify for the lead series right now. Um, do you think some of that experience from the classic prep from the classic has helped you fish your tournaments now? Yeah, whether it be the classic or a weekend tournament, I think every tournament helps you make prior decisions in other tournaments. Um, you know, I I won a big tournament last week in a local tournament. And I think that helps you make decisions on the road. I it definitely sticks out to me. So in 2022, when I had I had three top tens in the opens in 2022, and I was kind of in a slump right off the bat. The first couple of tournaments, I I was just struggling. Um, so I just started going fishing a bunch, just like every day. And I actually won a big local tournament that we had the day before I left to go practice for Ross Barnett. Um, so I had that kind of momentum. I was confident. I was making good decisions. And uh, that means a lot in tournament bass fishing. I went went on in Ross Barnett, ended up getting a third place finish there. And I just kind of rode that momentum throughout a lot of the rest of the season. Um, but I'm on the water, whether it be the Bassmaster Classic, um, Bassmaster Opens, you know, weekend derbies. Every time you get on the water, it definitely helps make mature decisions. And I think I'm to the point now to where my decisions are confident. My, my decisions are mature. Um, I fished enough, you know, that now I'm making those decisions that I should be. Best memory from the classic before we get ready to let you go here. I would say the first bass that I caught was honestly like, so like I said, I turned right, should have turned left. It was super windy. I had a little bank that uh, I literally shook off 25 pounds on a frog in practice. Wow. And I there but i rolled up there there was like three foot waves and i was throwing a frog and my frog was on top of a wave it come down to the bottom of it and 
I didn't see it anymore when I was popping it and one ate it and I caught it. It was like a three pounder, but that was pretty awesome. The night of champions is really awesome. You got to spend the night with my wife. Um, all the fellow anglers, you know, significant others were there. Um, it's just an awesome week. Everything about it is incredible. Um, the hotels that they, that Bass provides for us are incredible. Um, they've got room keys with, with our faces on it. Just the whole week is just like you're put on a pedestal and, it's a feeling that as an angler, I feel like everybody deserves to have. And uh, it's one that I'm definitely never going to forget. And I hope to experience it again, for sure. Well, hey, Trevor, I know uh, we woke up early. You're getting ready to go fishing. You know, I'm coming from you from the uh, hotel motel holiday Inn, And um, we will see you on the water. And uh, good luck this season, man. Yep. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. All right, guys, join us right after a quick commercial break. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at mwomag.com. That's MWOMag.com. Alrighty, everyone. Well, hey, that's all we got this week. I want to obviously thank our guests for taking the time out of their busy schedule after such a chaotic, awesome week that they had. And next year, we're going to try all we can to get to the Classic. No promises, but we're going to try to be there. It's another year. These anglers will go back on the Elite Series this year, go back to fishing the Opens, and they'll be working all season long to qualify for the Classic because... If you don't win the Angler of the Year, the next best thing is to qualify for the Classic to try to win $300,000. So I had a lot of fun here with you guys today. Obviously, thanks to Fish Daddy, it is open water season. So whether you guys need some new open water baits for walleye fishing, crappie fishing, or want to check out our new bass fishing line with biodegradable silicone instead of plastic, I highly recommend it. Go over to fishdaddyoutdoors.com and fill that card up and catch some more fish this year. Now, guys, that's all we got for you this week. We have a great show coming to you in two weeks from now, so come back. As always, I'm Jim O'Neill, and this is the Midwest Outdoors Podcast. We will see you guys next time. Tight lines.